Monday. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. Before we get into today's case, I have a few things to let you guys know about. First of all, today is also the premiere of Three Men and a Mystery Season 2. Now, that's not happening on this channel anymore. We've moved it over to its own channel. You want to be sure not to miss it. We're getting into a very deep case, the death of Elisa Gomez. We've got access to materials like I've never had before. Uh, you guys really need to check it out. There's a link in the description box below for the Three Men and a Mystery YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe to it while you're there or just check it out wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Speaking of favorite podcasts, if any of you out there are fans of Today in True Crime, you're going to hear a very familiar voice on there this week. I believe it's being released on the 13th and I will be a guest host for any fans of old school brain scratches where I kind of get into more fringy topics. I think you're really going to dig this episode and I think it's going to be interesting to hear me on a show that is produced in a little bit of a different way. So I hope you guys will check that out. That's Today in True Crime. I'll be sure to uh, tweet a link out to it. So be sure you're following me on Twitter at Lord and Arts. I'll also try sending out a YouTube post about it when it hits as well. So today's case, you know, uh, frequently when I'm looking through my list of brain scratch cases, which is literally hundreds of submissions from all of you wonderful, caring people, sometimes I will see cases from the 80s and they're a little bit tougher to research um, because, you know, the internet really wasn't around back then. So sometimes finding media about those cases is, is a lot tougher. But outside of that, I really try to pick cases where I feel like we can help, that raising exposure can help make some type of immediate change in that case. And with older cases, I don't always feel that way. But after today's story, I might have to rethink that. Today's story is called Missing Since the 80s. In September of 1986, Edgar Latulip was a 21-year-old man with a 12-year-old's mind. He had lived at home with his mother, Sylvia Wilson, until he came of age and was able to move to a group home near Kitchener, Ontario. Edgar's life had been at times quite tough, and as a result, he had tried to take his life several times before. Even though she had no proof, Sylvia had thought for years that Edgar had been abused because of his developmental disorder. She felt that his disability and the bullying were taking a toll on his state of mind. The last time she saw her son was on a Tuesday. She had visited Edgar, who was in the hospital, recovering from yet another attempt at taking his life. When he was discharged, instead of traveling back to his group home, Edgar simply walked away, leaving his medication and everything he owned behind. After Sylvia found out that her son had left, she quickly called local police to report him missing. After all, Edgar didn't have the skills he needed to survive for long on his own, especially without his medication. Police were able to track Edgar's movements for at least part of his day. After leaving the facility, he traveled by bus to Niagara Falls. Officers knew his past mental history and feared that he had traveled to the falls to try to take his life yet again. The falls were searched, but no body was found and no witnesses saw Edgar there. Investigators now had an official missing persons case on their hands. Posters were quickly distributed all over the province, showing a young man with wire-rimmed glasses and a large toothy grin. It described him as having a thin build, a scar above one eyebrow, and developmental issues. Sylvia feared her son had been killed and buried somewhere that they would never find. This is always at the back of my mind, she stated. With the disappearance of her son, Sylvia became despondent and had to take a leave of absence from work. Eventually, she would have a nervous breakdown. For years, investigators searched for Edgar. They handed out flyers and would periodically go door to door asking if anyone had seen or remembered anything from that fateful Tuesday. They updated their missing poster to include a computer-aged picture showing what Edgar would look like as an older man. They even republicized his case, along with several others, in hopes of solving not just his case, but the others as well. In 1993, authorities received a lead that led to nearby Hamilton after someone reported seeing Edgar there. Sadly, the man reported was never found. Then, in 2014, Sergeant Richard Dorling, a homicide detective with Waterloo Regional Police, started encouraging local media and members of the community to spread the word. 
pass the information on, Dorling told the region record. If you see a poster, a picture, or an article, post it on Facebook. Send it out on Twitter. I'm hoping somewhere out there, someone will remember something. No new leads would come to light until January of 2016, when a man in nearby St. Catharines, Ontario, claimed to be Edgar Latulip. The man, who was in his 50s and had the same developmental delays, lived in a home just 80 miles from Edgar's. He had lived in the area for 30 years, following an accident that had given him amnesia. On the first of the year, while working with his social worker, he began to have flashbacks of a life that was new to him. He also claimed that a name kept ringing in his head, and the name was Edgar Latulip. Working together, the two started searching the internet and finding his missing persons poster, became convinced he was correct. After submitting to a voluntary DNA test and comparing that sample to a family member of Edgar's, police were able to confirm his identity. He was indeed the missing man. Police believe that after traveling to the falls that day, Edgar somehow hit his head and the resulting injury gave him amnesia. Not knowing who he was or that he had left his family behind, he assumed a new identity, settled in a new city, and built himself a new life. The next task was a happy one for investigators. They were now able to contact his mother, who was said to be overjoyed. Quote, After 30 years of not knowing where her son is, knowing that he's alive, she's pretty excited about that. Elena Holtam, a Waterloo Regional Police Service spokeswoman, stated. Quickly, mother and son started working on a plan to reunite. Being away from home, even with not knowing that you are actually someone else, can take a serious emotional toll on a person. Edgar would be taking the family reintegration process slowly. Pina Arcamone, director of the Missing Children's Network, called it incredible news. Edgar's recovery is the reason why we never give up hope. Lucia Dion of Ontario's Missing Adults wrote in a Facebook post that the story is nothing short of amazing and encouraged everyone to do their part to help find the missing. It can mean sitting with a friend who's dealing with a missing loved one to show your support. It may mean passing along a resource guidebook that you found online. Respectful conversations about the missing can lead to an amazing number of eyes helping in the search. Dwayne Gingrich, a Waterloo Regional Police detective on the case, said he was elated. I had hopes that he was out there somewhere. For us as investigators, this is great. This is awesome. It's satisfying because most of these cases don't turn out this way. You expect the worst when a person is missing for that period of time. It's the only case that I know of where we've been able to find someone who has been missing for this period of time. Police would not comment on his life before his disappearance or the accident that caused him to forget it. It also remains unclear what kind of life he built for himself after vanishing. What was his name? Did he have a job or a family? Respectfully, police have remained silent. This case, like the Chalet McDonald case or the North Pond Hermit cases that we've covered on this show previously, once again demonstrates that not everyone disappears in the dark ways we so often hear about and fear. Sometimes, fate will not only take them away, but can also bring them back with unexpected explanations. Case cracked by the person who went missing himself. A big thank you to the Washington Post, LearningHistory.com, LittleThings.com, NationalPost.com, The Independent UK, Maxim.com, NBC News, New York Daily News, and of course, Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's topic. Um, like I said, this case just makes me think twice about those cases that I'm not jumping right into with Searchlight. Uh, of course, when you have you know a list of over 300 cases, um, it's, it's, it's hard to try to take on all that work and to, and to really figure out where can you be most helpful. But, um, I'm telling you just because someone went disappearing in the eighties, stories like this, uh, remind me that we never can ever give up hope. We need to always keep trying. And I love that there was officers that 20, over 20 years after he disappeared, they kept trying. And then here we have this amazing twist more than 30 years later where he is actually found. 
Uh, I also personally hope that Edgar has reintegrated with his family. I hope everything is going great on that front. I totally understand why they want to respect uh, the privacy of him. As a matter of fact, I don't think we've even seen like really current pictures of him or anything like that. Um, I think as observers, we can all just be happy with the outcome for Edgar and his family and maybe learn some lessons. uh, I know I have already uh, from hearing their story. A big thank you to new patrons, Allison Wilbur, Jacqueline McCall, Rain McCallies, hope I'm saying that right, Rain, and James Bennett. They all joined on Patreon and are now supporting the channel. You can do the same. If you'd like to learn more, you can head over to www.lordandarts.com. You can buy merch, support on Patreon, support on PayPal, buy the audiobook. All of it helps keep me here doing what I love doing, spending time with all of you amazing, caring people about these amazing cases that we cover. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful Monday. Don't forget, a couple of more things. If you want to check out Three Men in a Mystery, you can head over right now. Uh, and then later this week, today in true crime, spend some more time with me, won't you? Take care, and I'll see you back here on Wednesday with another episode of Searchlight on the Lord and Arts channel.